And on behalf of Polis Center for Politics, I'm excited to welcome you to The Vote, Reimagining What It Could Be. This is a two-day symposium in which we will think really seriously about democratic citizenship. And we will turn to a diverse range of voices in our community, including researchers, students, activists, um, faculty members, community members, and innovators who will help us think big about the challenge of producing equitable democracy and to look toward a future in which democracy can approach more universal participation in forms of engagement, such as voting. Um, I'm really excited about the roster of, of guests that we have joining us. They come from coast to coast in the US and multiple continents. And I think that there will be something for everyone in this lineup. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, before we get started, I want to offer some thanks. This set of events would not have been possible without um, policies home team. So a big thanks to our director, Professor Mac McCorkle, to our program coordinator, Anna Kinnear, to our wonderful team of Polis Directors Fellows, both undergraduate and graduate fellows, as well as our PhD fellow, Morena Martinez. Also ex extremely grateful for the generous support of Diana and Todd Stiefel, whose support made this series possible, as well as our co-sponsors. Uh, we're delighted to work with uh, the DeWitt Wallace Center for uh, media and democracy, the Heart Leadership Program, the Jordan Institute for Families at UNC, and the North Carolina Scholar Strategy Network. So to all of our partners, thanks so much for the opportunity to collaborate with you. And I'm excited to introduce our very first panel for today. So this kickoff panel uh, will give us an opportunity to think seriously about how we generate uh, civic engagement among our youngest citizens. So it's it's titled Making Young Voters, and we get to hear from a collection of researchers and student activists who will guide us in this discussion. So before I turn it over to this amazing panel, um, and the panelists uh, will, will share their videos soon, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator. So we're really excited that Professor Eric Malin will lead us in this discussion. Professor Malin is a distinguished faculty fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics and a lecturer at Duke University Stanford School of Public Policy. He was the founding executive director of the Duke Engage program and assistant vice provost for civic engagement at Duke University. Before he was the founding director of, before that, he was the founding director of the Robertson Scholars program and he served on the political science faculty of UNC Chapel Hill. He's currently the director of the Certificate of Civic Engagement and Social Change and chairs Duke's Global Travel Advisory Committee. He collaborates with colleagues across the campus on the development and implementation of Project Citizen, which seeks to put the consideration of citizenship at the center of the Duke experience and the Duke community. His intellectual interests focus on the role of higher education in fostering democracy and working with undergraduates to foster political and civic engagement. Eric holds a BA in political science from Tufts University and a PhD in political science from the University of Minnesota. And I have to say, we are extremely lucky to have him as a member of our policy steering committee as one of the most powerful voices for civic engagement and democracy at Duke. So Eric, uh, thank you so much for being with us today and it's all yours. Thank you so much, Deandra. And um, I'm really, uh, pleased and honored to be moderating this first panel uh, for this incredibly interesting symposium that you've put together. And my thanks to you, Deandra, for all the hard work that you've done. I can't think of a more important topic. Um, I'll ask the panelists to uh, join in on the um, uh, webinar. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, do uh, an introduction and then. Um, um, I'll give you the lay of the land of how we will proceed. And, and this is just a wonderful combination of um, a faculty member with deep expertise in this topic and then students who are leading uh, at Duke University in uh, student uh, political and civic participation. Um, so first I'd like to introduce John Holbein. Uh, John is an assistant professor of public policy, politics and education at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. He studies political participation, 
political inequality, democratic accountability, and political representation. His um, political science and public policy work has appeared in the top political science journals. Uh, I won't name them all, but I will name his book, which has had a huge impact on the field uh, in a very short time. Uh, and you know, John will talk about his book, Making Young Voters, Converting Civic Attitudes into Civic Action, which was published by Cambridge University uh, Press. And so I look forward to that. Um, next on the panel, I wanted to introduce Lauren. Uh, Lauren Howell um, is a senior at Duke, majoring in public policy minoring in education and visual media studies. Uh, she did an internship with the U.S. House of Representatives for a year and has also been involved with the Hart Leadership Program. Uh, she's continued this work with an internship at Duke's Democracy Lab, urging Raleigh constituents to demand change with their voices and votes. She serves as the RDU Chapter President of North Carolina Building Our Revolution Now and has organized numerous Black Lives Matters protests in her hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I have had the opportunity to hear Lauren speak uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, having a conversation with Lauren uh, today. Finally, I wanted to introduce Jessica Sullivan. It's been my uh, pleasure to get to know Jessica uh, this semester in particular. Uh, she's a senior studying in politi political science and statistics. Uh, she's coming to us from Salisbury, North Carolina. She's the chair of Duke Votes, a nonpartisan student-led organization that works to register, educate, and mobilize members of the Duke community to vote. She helped start Duke Votes in the fall of 2018. She was a sole fellow with the Heart Leadership Program, uh, and she has been involved with almost every possible voting initiative, including You Can Vote as a Civic Fellow. Jessica is working day and night on promoting uh, voting at, at Duke, and um, looking forward to hearing from her. So here's the way we're going to proceed. Um, I'm going to ask John to uh, present his book sort of as a foundation for our conversation, which he wrote with Sunshine Hillegas of, of our own faculty. Um, John will take about 10 minutes to do that, and then we'll have a 25-minute conversation amongst us um, about Jessica and Lauren's work and how, it, um, how uh, John's work sort of sheds light on that. And then the last 15 minutes will be uh, for questions and answers from those who are joining from the audience. So, um, John, it's all yours for now. Great, thanks, Eric. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen sure. with a few slides. Uh, can everyone see that all right? Good, okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, one thing that um, Eric didn't mention is I'm a proud graduate of the Sanford School of Public Policy, a class of 2016 uh, PhD program. So it's always great to be uh, back at Duke, uh, though I, I work at UVA now, a piece of my heart will always be at Duke uh, and at the Sanford School. So um, as Eric mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about uh, Sunshine Hillegas and myself's work uh, in the space of thinking about uh, how to increase voter turnout among young people. Uh, so as Eric mentioned, this is a, a part of our, our book uh, uh, that we was released earlier this year. Um, so just give you a, a bit of background. Many of you probably are aware of these general patterns overall, but youth turnout in the United States is dismally low. Uh, so to give you some idea, I'm plotting here for you over time, over the past uh, uh, three decades or so, rates of voter turnout here at the top among those individuals who are aged uh, 60 and above as a, as a, a comparison point. Then if we look, uh, sort of uh, plotting the, uh, the, the rates of voter turnout of 18 to 29 year olds, you can see that this massive gap arises. And just to highlight that for you, here, here is the difference between those two lines. So you can see over the past uh, three decades or so, and even if you extended this time series back further, it is as much a truism of American politics that young people uh, are unlikely to vote as Republicans are to vote for Republicans and Democrats are to vote for Democrats. This is a part of our political uh, process that has been um, long uh, a part of, uh, of what we've seen in elections. And to give you a little bit of a sense of this gap uh, in the United States relative to other countries, what I'm gonna plot here for you is just a bunch of bar graphs that show the difference between voting rates uh, of 60 plus year olds, what I just showed on the last screen, and then 18 to 29 year olds. And I'm gonna order those uh, across countries from those that have the smallest gap on the left, meaning uh, there's uh, the, the young people and older citizens vote at a similar rate. Uh, and then the far right side, it's gonna be an area where youth turnout is especially low in the country. 
okay? So here is that figure, and as if you can see on the far right-hand side is the United States, right? Uh, th this uh, difference between older and younger voters is uniquely large in the United States, and we can talk about reasons for why that is, but it's larger than even comparable countries like Canada, Germany, and other locations uh, that are, 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 the gap is much smaller uh, than in the United States. So uh, this book really uh, came as a genesis of seeing these patterns and knowing that these patterns existed, but sort of saying to ourselves, okay, why is this? Why is it that young people don't cast a ballot? Let's really dig into like the root causes of it. Okay, so based on previous research, when we started this book, there, were, there is a literature on how to get young people to vote. We, we looked at it and we saw a lot of explanations for why young people didn't vote, starting and ending with this explanation that young people are just apathetic, they're disinterested in politics, they don't care about politics, they don't care about public policy, and they're disengaged. And the implication of that uh, uh, line of thinking is that in order to increase youth voter participation, we need to make young people interested in politics. We need to make voting cool or interesting. We need to make young people want to engage in politics to really enhance their desire to engage. And so we actually see this approach not only in research, but in the real world with organizations like Rock the Vote seeking to make voting cool, right? And we've seen many instances of, uh, of efforts to target young people that focus on enhancing political interests, driving up young people's levels of engagement and interest uh, through that channel. The, the, there's a slight problem, however, with this approach. And the problem is that young people are already very interested in politics, regardless of how you measure it. And I've got two measures up here for you. Levels of political interest are very high. So if we look at interest in elections, or if uh, we look at a measure of how much uh, young people care who is president, or if we look at uh, interest in, in, in uh, public policy and public affairs more generally, or if even more directly, we look at a stated intention to vote, a desire to engage in this foundational act of democracy, it's high, right? In, in all cases, it's, it's above half of young people are interested in politics and by a lot. Right. So in, in recent years, we've seen that uh, upwards of 90 percent of young people say that they intend to vote and 80 percent say that they're interested in elections. But the problem is that voter turnout lags behind. Right. So we have what we affectionately uh, call in the book the follow through gap, the difference between one's desire or one's intention to participate in politics and their actual behavior of casting a ballot. So as this figure illustrates, interest among young people doesn't seem to be the big problem. You could increase voter participation by driving up political interest, but you're kind of getting to the ceiling of where of our measures of political interest. Young people are very interested in politics. And we see this in various uh, other modes of civic participation, online discussion, uh, protests. We just don't see it following in voting, okay? Um, uh, to, to give you one more piece of context for this, 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 this difference, this follow through gap that I just showed you, you can, you can do a similar calculation for older citizens say, what's the gap between their intention to vote and they're actually casting a ballot? And it's, uh, the gap is much larger for young people. Young people are especially bad at following through on their stated intention to participate in politics. So it's about follow through rather than a lack of interest, okay? Um, so why is it that young people struggle to follow through? So to really crack open this nut, we did a couple of things. So we've, we, the, in the book, we're using both quantitative and qualitative methods and data from a variety of different sources. In our qualitative interviews, we targeted young people from around the country that had various experiences with the voting. Some of them regularly cast a ballot, some of them rarely cast a ballot, uh, some of them did sporadically, okay? And so we asked them in open-ended questions, we said, okay, well, why is it that you didn't actually cast a ballot? Or so we started, you know, are you interested in politics? We found very much similar results as to the survey data I just showed you. They were interested in politics. Okay, so did you cast a ballot? Well, no, in most cases, no. Um, so why, right? Let's, let's dig into that a little bit deeper. And we found sort of three key elements that seem to be stopping young people from casting a ballot, from following through on their intention to vote. The first is that they tend to lack confidence in themselves. They often think they need to know much more than they actually do. And I put up a quote here that sort of uh, illustrates some of these themes, that young people are intimidated by the voting process, that they don't believe that they have enough um, knowledge to uh, engage in politics, okay? 
Uh, the second is that they find the process itself confusing, right? And this might be especially salient in it, and we're kind of seeing it being especially salient in the current election where election rules are ever changing. There's lots of fights. It's uncertain how voting and registration will look even as we uh, get really close to, to election day. Uh, and in fact, many young people make errors. So one study that we found and we cite in the book went out and collected a sample of, in, of data from young people who are registering to vote looked in fine-grained detail on the voter registration forms that they were sending in and found that half of young, the young people in their sample had made errors on the voter registration form that would kick it back uh, and reject their voter registration. Okay, and we saw this in our interviews as well with young people, that, that particularly registration to vote seemed arcane and complex and intimidating. Okay? And then the final uh, uh, thing is, it has to do more generally with the, the obstacles and challenges that young people face in general. Young people are just coming into coming of age and, and um, often many of them have moved recently before an election uh, and their life is just in flux. It's a period of change and turmoil that comes exactly when we expect them to vote at age 18, okay? So these are not the only challenges that young people face. But these are the types of things that we were, we were seeing again and again in our interviews with young people, okay? So now that I've sort of discussed and motivated what we think is the problem, not, not a lack of interest, but a lack of follow through on interest that young people have, what can we do about it, okay? Well, there's two paths. And one of them is sort of uh, along the lines of, of changing how we run elections. And the second is changing how we prepare young people to be actively involved in the political process. Okay, so in our book, we have a full chapter that discusses the effect of various election uh, law reforms that make registration and voting easier. And it turns out that if you look at the effect of some of these laws, pre-registration pre aside, because it's just targeting young people, but if you look at reforms like same-day registration, online registration, automatic voter registration, and voter registration drives, these tend to have pretty modest effects among all adults. But when you look at young people specifically, these types of reforms that make it easier to register to vote and easier and more streamlined to cast a ballot have an especially large impact on young people. So uh, we're, we're talking on the order of a, of a five to eight percentage point increase uh, for uh, in implementing pre-registration, for example, and an even larger effect for things like same-day registration or, or AVR. Okay, let's, uh, I'm gonna just zoom in. We don't have time to talk through all of these findings and, and how uh, we, we come to this conclusion, but let's just mention very briefly a set of uh, reforms that I think would help a lot with young people and then only get sporadically implemented at, at, at present before the pandemic and then have um, kind of disappeared in a lot of places uh, uh, from what we're hearing uh, and that's voter registration drives. So we have some evidence and good evidence at that, that voter registration drives among young people increase the chances that those young people will cast a ballot. This suggests that voter registration is a barrier and that once you sort of remove that barrier or make it easier to overcome that barrier, young people are much more likely to vote. And the evidence we have from this is from a randomized control trial that was conducted a few years ago called the first time voters program. And in the first time voters program, it involved a classroom visit to high schoolers that lasted only 45 minutes. So in that 45 minute period, there was a short presentation about the importance of voting, uh, uh, an opportunity for young people to register to vote, and then uh, sort of a demonstration of what a ballot looks like and a voting booth and, and what the voting experience would look like. This relatively short and relatively light touch intervention had the effect of increasing youth voter participation by almost six percentage points. Now you might say, okay, well, that's not all the way that we wanna get there uh, to, to um, higher levels of voter turnout to complete completely closing the gap, but it is a pretty substantial gain in this sample. It was an increase from 25% to, to almost 31%, right? So that's a step in the right direction. And when we're thinking about increasing youth turnout, we have to do lots of different things uh, to change this. So this is one, one area that's relatively small and light touch, but seeing relatively uh, large um, um, sizable returns. Okay, uh, the second area that I'll just mention very briefly that we need to be thinking about is not only how we structure the voting process itself, but how we prepare young people from when they're children through early adolescence, through high school and graduation and, and then beyond to the workforce or, 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 or 
higher education. We need to rethink fundamentally how civics is working. One of the things we did in this book was interview civics instructors from around the United States to get the lay of the land of what's going on right now in civics. Because we, found, we have in this chapter that shows that civics education exposure uh, doesn't increase the chances that young people vote. So we said, well, why is that? And what we found was that predominantly the approach to civics in the United States today is what we call bubble sheet civics. And it's basically teaching uh, students uh, to memorize facts, arcane facts about American history, rather than engaging with politics of today. So what we've, what we've found uh, in, in our um, building off of this in our book was that there's not enough time in civics education spent talking about contemporary political issues. Most of civics is talking about history rather than the current moment, having debates about key political issues, about climate change or racial inequality. These things are just not happening as much as we might hope in uh, civics education. Okay. Uh, there's not, a, though I showed you an example of one program just a moment ago, the first time voters program, this is an anomaly. Uh, this is not a status quo. Uh, uh, civics education to help young people register and to talk about how to vote. Okay? And then finally, what we found is that schools that help actually develop skills that help young people follow through on their intentions, that help them work well with other people, those have a real effects on, on whether or not young people cast a ballot. And uh, for, uh, sorry about that, for evidence of this, we went to uh, a couple of um, charter schools that have been developed and opened in, in recent years uh, called the Democracy Prep Park Public Schools. And these Democracy Prep Public Schools are doing sort of the opposite of what I just explained is the status quo approach to civics. They're really um, emphasizing active learning, getting involved in community engagement, having uh, students participate in team run activities that try and uh, address a social issue in the community, meeting with uh, public officials and talking about contemporary, contemporary political issues, having young people, even before they're eligible to vote, go out and help other citizens register to vote, encourage them to, to vote to canvas uh, in a nonpartisan way. And what was found recently in a, in a really uh, interesting and influential study out of Mathematica was that this approach ha also has a pretty sizable and meaningful impact. Again, we're not getting all the way to 100% youth turnout, but we're taking a big step in, in the right direction when we reorient civics from this dry, bland, bubble sheet civics to a more applied and active learning environment that gets young people excited and able to develop the skills that they need to be active voters. Okay, uh, so to just to sum up uh, the three key points that I would drive home the importance of um, based on our work is that it's really important to think about the problem of youth voting in the right way. It's not that young people lack an interest in politics. They are very interested in politics. They just lack the wherewithal uh, and the experience to follow through on the good intentions that they have. So you could think about lots of different ways that we might tweak our various mobilization strategies so not so much as like focus on making voting cool or interesting or exciting, but helping young people actually follow through with something that they say that they want to do, that they, they show evidence of wanting to do, uh, to actually do that. Okay. The second thing that I would take away is it's really important. The work of helping young uh, people register to vote is not always the, the most exciting uh, thing uh, to do and to think about doing, but it's a really important obstacle and barrier that stops a lot of young people from voting. And when we help young people register to vote, it increases the odds that they'll actually uh, follow through and vote. And then finally, when we're thinking about the types of things that we should teach our young people, we should be thinking not only about knowledge and facts about politics, just giving them tons of information. This is this is a very common approach in the voting uh, uh, literature and the voting community. It's, you know, well, we see this problem of low voter turnout. Let's just throw tons of information at the electorate. Maybe they, do, they just don't know enough. And that's, that, that's important. It's important for voters to be informed and to have high levels of political knowledge. Don't get me wrong. However, it misses a key step of helping uh, uh, develop sort of an applied experience with actually the act of voting, of developing the skills that help uh, young people actually follow through on their intentions and to work with other people effectively uh, in various uh, social issues. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop and I'm looking forward to the rest of the great discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, and uh, John and I were joking uh, earlier, um, the, the focus on non-cognitive factors of young people helped me understand a little bit why my own teenage children don't take out the garbage or return my phone calls. Um, and and in, in a lot of ways, 
uh, the book uh, shattered a paradigm about uh, youth voting. And so I urge people who are interested in this topic to, to take a look at the, the multi-method analysis that John and Sunshine uh, use. And also, sorry, I, I'm sorry I forgot to claim you as one of our own. I had forgotten that, John. And when I read your bio quickly, I thought you had gone to Stanford. And I didn't want to give them credit. And so I skipped <laughs> it. Uh, and so such a, so proud to uh, have you proud, as proud you alum. <laughs> Yeah, good. Um, so I wanted to uh, bring in Jessica and Lauren to the conversation, um, who are two of our most active uh, students at, at the university, uh, and ask them, um, and I think I'd like to start with Lauren and then Jessica, um, to reflect a little bit on the different approaches that you've chosen uh, to be politically and civically engaged. Um, Lauren's work has focused on community organizing, protesting, um, and being a, an activist, Jessica's work has uh, focused very much on uh, voting and doing um, the, the kind of work that John described, which is to uh, help young people figure out how to vote. And I just wanted to uh, ask each of you to reflect on um, how you made that decision and what your experience has been. And I'd like to start with you, Lauren. Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think that mostly, um, we focus on direct, but also indirect action. So meaning that we can have one day where we sit and we talk about the movement for black lives and how that maybe is applicable to environmentalism and restorative justice. And we talk through that history and kind of specify those problems um, and dive deeper into them. And then other days we'll be marching like rain or shine, um, giving demands to elected officials. So when um, President Trump visited North Carolina and he came to Morrisville earlier this summer um, and he went to look at the vaccine, we had um, a demonstration where we had like demands regarding COVID regulations and how that is related to social justice as well. Um, or earlier this summer, um, the General Assembly passed a bill called SB 168. And if Roy Cooper would have signed it, it would have prevented the public from gaining access to medical records of those who are in prison, police, or jail custody. So we slept outside of his house for seven days just to like urge him not to sign, um, to urge him to veto the bill essentially. Um, so in that regard, we interact with a lot of elected officials in various capacities, um, mostly at the local level, whether it be like our police chief, our mayor. Um, but I think that that has presented a lot of conversation and the experiences that we've had that have been negative have generated a lot of like negativity regarding, um, like you were talking about earlier, young people's capacity or belief that they can change the situation that they're in. So um, I definitely, have had a lot of conversations about voting, trying to encourage people to vote, especially in this moment. And Jessica, that's why I think your work is like so important. So I'd love to hear about what you're doing as well. Thanks, Lauren. Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was really drawn to this work because I had just turned 17 in 2016. Um, so I was not able to vote in that election. And so just seeing such a huge election play out and not have any role in it really had an impact on me and my perception of democracy and what it really means to have a voice and to have a vote. Um, so at Duke, I helped to develop Duke Votes, which has been a central hub of resources and just information, um, activism around voting on campus. And so we have really built a, a network of professors, of undergraduates, of graduate students, of staff, of faculty, really across the, um, the university on this common goal of um, promoting turnout in this election. Um, and I found a lot of the same things that, John, that you mentioned in your presentation where these students are really, really eager to vote. It is not that they don't wanna vote, it's that they don't have the information, it's that their situation is constantly changing. Um, in three years, I've had three different election precincts. Um, and so it's confusing and you don't know all the information that you need to know. And so we're try trying to just really be a resource for students and really provide that information, excuse me, information in a way that is accessible and is available to them um, where they are. Good. Thank, thank you, Jessica. And Jessica, let me just follow up with you. Um, does, so you are in the weeds. I know I work very closely with you on student voting. So, for example, 
you, and you've taught me so much. What, one thing at Duke is if you move from East Campus to West Campus, you have to re-register, right? And all of our first year students move from East Campus. Well, you know, you know COVID uh, is different. Um, does John's up, do John and Sunshine's observations resonate for you as the leader of Duke Votes? Would you add anything to it? No, I think that their observations are absolutely what I've been seeing um, in the field. I mean, every single Duke student in Durham this year, unless they are an RA, will have to re-register to vote. So moving from east to west, moving from west off campus, and that's just a huge push. And so we've been able to actually have a voter registration tent, socially distanced on campus, and we've gotten over 500 registrations in just two weeks. And so those drives are huge. Um, and I think that's just a really important component of it is just making registration accessible and making that information accessible. Good, thank you. John, uh, Lauren, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to Please. say really quickly, um, I think that John, like you mentioned how the drives are so important, but I think that like, adding that element of young people trying to engage young people to vote like is very powerful to me because I think that young people um, like you said how they feel they don't have the proper knowledge or they're not well informed seeing another young person who's trying to encourage you to vote I feel like gives you that power it makes you think I can do it so I yeah, think it makes it less intimidating like yeah yeah yeah, I think that, that that really resonates with me. And there's a lot of organizations now. Um, what, the, the one that jumps immediately to mind is Inspire USA that's doing a lot of sort of peer-to-peer -peer stuff, right? This sort of saying like, um, you know, we've done enough of this, like let's descend on a classroom and say, you know, how important this is. But we know from social science research that voting is really like social. It, it, though you go and cast a ballot by yourself, it's a social act. Like you, you, you wear the sticker proudly after you cast a ballot. You, you share on Facebook or other social media that you cast a ballot. Other, you know, other people potentially ask you if you if you vote. It's a really social event. So Lauren, I, I really, you know, agree with you a lot that this sort of peer-to-peer -peer type of, of, of organization is really powerful and has the potential to show effects even larger than, than, than what we've seen in the past where organizations come and sort of descend on, on, on young people. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's right. I think it's really important to, um, to think about these things that we're talking about. Just sort of going back to this idea that it, it has been sort of a common element that's come up in uh, discussions about the 2020 election of sort of like many young people feeling like that their, their vote doesn't matter. That, that, that this, 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 it's, it's sort of um, th that uh, protesting is the venue to do it. And it's only protesting and, and why would we vote kind of thing instead of marrying the two together. There's been some really good social science research that's come out since our book was released even just a few months ago that suggests that when young people are mobilized, when you see this influx of mobilization that comes, especially from uh, implement states implementing pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, when that influx of young people comes in, elected officials' behavior changes. Suddenly they realize that the people who are going to be voting for them in upcoming elections are young people. And so the types of issues that they're paying attention to changes. So the study that I'm thinking about especially was conducted and showed that after this influx of young people came into the electorate, uh, public officials started paying a lot more attention among other things to public education, right? So we're seeing a sort of a, a groundswell movement in this case, uh, changing uh, the focus of public policymakers. There's sort of this, this loop is being completed back into policymaking. So I, th this is a hard message to get out there to young people that, that what you really want them to do is everything, right? Not, not just casting a ballot, not just protesting, doing everything that they can to be civically engaged. But this piece of voting is really important because like you said, Lauren, right? Like I think many young people could uh, pick up this broader narrative out there that's, that the voting's kind of, you know, why would we vote? It doesn't really matter, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't have an effect. It does have an effect and it does matter for public policy and the things we care about downstream. Thanks for that, John. And I've noticed there's a, a que some question and questions coming in Please feel free to submit those and I'll uh, begin to get to those uh, in a few minutes. Um, John, something, uh, and I'll ask our other panelists to reflect on this too, but listening, uh, having read your book this summer and then listening to you speak today and looking at that chart that shows that um, this is uh, uniquely uh, bad in the United States. So knowing what we know about the cognitive abilities of 18 to 29 year olds, 24 year olds, um, if one were to design a voting system to dissuade them from voting, you might design our system. 
Um, <laughs> and and uh, I, I think Jessica realizes that, as, as, you know, so how much, how much, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. It, it, is, is this subtle, unconscious or conscious voter suppression, this kind of, the kinds of voting rules that we know um, suppress the activity of a particular segment of society that tends to lean one way politically? Uh, I think unquestionably, yeah. I think uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not clear to me whether or not it's conscious or unconscious, but it's clear to me that its consequences are troubling, uh, at, to say the least, for patterns of, of, of voting among young people. And we actually talk about this a little bit in the book because like, um, the, the standard approach to trying to solve this problem of getting more young people to vote is to try and make the voting process easier. And that, that should happen, that, that works, right, as we show in the book. But it's become so polarized. I mean, we've seen this in the current debate about vote by mail that I just I'm I, I'm left feeling a little discouraged about the that 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 channel's possibility. I, I, mm -hmm. I think about like civics a lot in the follow up to this book because you know I, I just don't know what the political terrain is for making voting and registration easier in the current environment of. Of, of many state legislators, legislatures going in the opposite direction, uh, many you know, judicial decisions potentially um, not being favorable in that way. I think there are still means that we can think about helping young people overcome those those, those obstacles that they face. But I, I think it's certainly no question that the the that the the, the right to vote is is very much. Um, uh, something that is under attack in the United States today, um, and 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 uh, I think that you know we we should fight against that. We should we should try and enfranchise more people, and we should push on that channel. But we shouldn't forget our other channels as well. I, the, the way I like to think about this is like you know in, in in deep red Republican states, there are lots of young people who we would still want to see them cast their ballots. This is we don't want to forget them, right? So what do we do for them? Those pe young people who are for all intents and purposes going to be living in states where uh, voter registration and voting itself is really hard and overly complex than it needs to be. And I think the answer is we push for civics education reform. We, we push for helping young people to overcome the obstacles that they face. So yeah, I, I think that sort of gets at your question, but it's like it, it, the, political, the political terrain is a little bit depressing when you think about how the, the possibility to make voting and registration easier the way we've been talking about. It, it can make one nostalgic, John, when you read about the history of the 26th Amendment, which gave 18 to 21 year olds the right to vote in the Senate, voted 94 to zero to support that and only 19 opposed in the House. It's almost like, what planet did that happen on? Um, and of course, youth then were much more balanced in their support of Democrats and Republicans. So it was a different uh, terrain, but it-, it Yeah, I mean, I should, I, should, I should mention that like one of the things we found in studying pre-registration is that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's less partisan in, in, than it um, might appear to be, like you might think, than you might think. Um, so there, there are actually lots of young Republicans out there. We, we sometimes think that, you know, it's, it's only Democrats, but there are a lot of young Republicans out there that are often mobilized by, um, efforts to make voting and registration easier, right? Like the cost of voting, the, how, how complex it is, it affects all of us, right? And then disproportionately different uh, subsets of the electorate. But Republicans also sort of benefit from having an easier and more streamlined voting and registration process. That's not always true with election laws, but in many cases, we're sort of just fighting over, like I have some follow-up research that shows that voting by mail in, in the past several decades before this, this election was not partisan, right? Like it was not, it didn't help the Democrats, right? So it's, it's. It, I think there's a, an important way to think about like policy making would change if more young people voted, but it's not necessarily the case that just Democrats would win all the time. Right, right. Like, right. It, it's a little more nuanced than that. I think. Yeah. Jessica, can I ask you to reflect on this a little bit in, in terms of as you look at how the voting system is designed um, and perhaps what, if you could change something that would make your life easier as the as the head of Duke votes, what would it be? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think it's one that I maybe don't have as concrete of an answer as I maybe should, just because there are so many different facets of it that if they were to change would make it easier for young people to vote. So, um, you know, same day registration during early voting is amazing and is absolutely one of the best tools we have. Um, but for students living off campus, they'll need a utility bill with their name and address. And that is one of a number of documents that they could use, like a driver's license or a bank statement with their name and address. 
but for most students living off campus, the utility bill is really the only document they have um, that will qualify. And so if you're subletting or if your name is not on that utility bill, that's not a valid option for you anymore. And so I think something that I would choose to expand, and maybe this is just this early voting is, is high on my mind right now, um, would be to expand that list of documents and to kind of make students um, have a few more options with that. Um, and same thing with voter IDs, because when that was an issue in uh, 2019, we had a lot of trouble trying to figure out what it would look like. Thank you. Well, you, you, you've frozen on my screen, but I heard your answer. I got you. And uh, you undersold yourself. You had a perfect answer to that. And you've thought about this deeply and have lots of experience. Lauren, um, before we begin to turn to some of the quest excellent questions that are coming in, I wanted to ask you, amongst um, your peers and students who are as committed to you are, uh, at, you know, sleeping in front of the governor's mansion and activism and protest, what do you sense their view is now on voting? Um, from what I'm gathering, I think that um, amongst the community that we've been able to make, um, we've kind of, since we, since protesting is very much a collective action, like as is voting, there's a lot of like different views, surprisingly, when it comes to voting. So I would say there's like some people who feel when they're protesting that it um, emboldens them to vote. I would say there's also other people who I think focus more on the specific candidates rather than the action. So they feel like more mobilized to vote when they feel like they have a candidate who represents them. And when they feel like they don't, they kind of want to disengage and draw away from the political process. So I would say that's the main conversation that we've been navigating is the importance of voting in general, um, despite if you like who is on the ballot or not, um, and focusing also like down the ballot and how that impacts people and providing that sort of civic engagement, um, like learning while doing, since people I found lack the knowledge about what our elected officials do. But when you're on the streets and you're protesting and you see that a sheriff is an elected position, then you feel more inclined to maybe focus down the ballot. But I would say people are pretty, um, discouraged about um, having to vote for a particular candidate. And that's like driving the conversation right now. Yeah, yeah, some data, I, that, that's really helpful. Um, and then of course that community um, has different views. Some data that I've looked at recently suggests that um, in 2016, there was a much larger segment of 18 to 29 year olds who prefer to vote for a different candidate than Clinton and Trump than the data we're seeing now, which has about the same number of young people voting for President Trump, but a much higher number voting for Vice President Biden, fewer voting for third party candidates and fewer sitting out. At least that's a projection coming out of circle at, at Tufts University. So that'll be an interesting uh, dynamic to watch. Um, okay, so uh, we have some really good questions coming in. Uh, from our audience. And um, the first one, John, is for you. Uh, and um, one of our um, participants, one of the members of the audience asked, I like your analysis of young voter interest in politics and follow through with voting. It occurs to me that a person's interest in politics is different from having faith in the U.S. electoral process to allow meaningful choice. Are you familiar with how much this sort of perception might be involved in affecting voter turnout in young people? Yeah, so that, that's a great, uh, a great question. Thanks, Ryan, for asking that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely the case that like, uh, the, 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 there, there is a certain level of like, um, young people being disaffected by the process, being sort of disgusted. I mean, I, I, I watched the last debate with my students, uh, who are all young voters, right, or young voters and non-voters. Um, and they were all disgusted, right? Like, you know, I think as many of us were at, at how this process, what this process has become and the options that are available on the ballot. Um, that being said, I will say as, as, as a, you know, when you're studying youth voter turnout, it's not always the most, um, um, uh, I don't often feel optimistic, but this is an area where I actually do feel a little bit optimistic. So young, the, the graph that I showed you earlier about young people's levels of interest in politics and intention to vote, 
those are really high in spite of the fact that young people aren't seeing the candidates that they want and that they would sort of dream of that are speaking to them, right? Like still, even in spite of that, young people are saying, I wanna be involved, I want to vote. They're just being stopped along the way. So imagine a world where we give them candidates that are speaking more about climate change and education policy and racial inequality and the issues that they really care about than that are somewhat unique to young people. We would only expect voter turnout to be higher. There hasn't been a great uh, body of research on this yet, and I'm actually working on um, some follow-up projects to see how the candidates that do in, uh, declare to run for office influence whether or not young people cast a ballot. But we would only expect, given the data that we've seen thus far, that improving and enhancing sort of this process, improving uh, the quality of elections and the types of candidates that are running would improve uh, rates of youth participation. John, a, a follow-up question just dawned on me listening to your answer. Do, do you have, is there any data on whether young people are more vote, motivated by being against something than for something? Oh, yeah. That's a really good and interesting question. I, I think the other panelists would be really great to sort of speak to the current climate because there's lots of talk about, you know, sort of, um, you know, not necessarily excitement for Biden, but you know, excitement against Donald Trump kind of thing. Um, uh, not to my knowledge, uh, it's a really fascinating question of yeah. whether or not it's sort of uh, positive or negative, but I'd, I'd love to hear the other panel. Yeah, that's a great idea. Lauren, what, Lauren what's your sense? Uh, particularly, you're experiencing some people who feel like the electoral process is not the way you're going to achieve anything, and some who do. I wonder what you're sensing there. And then Jessica. Yeah, I think that in my experience, um, or well, at least in this election, I've seen people um, motivated a lot more by the negative. Um, but I've also seen people trying to find the positive, um, even if they don't like the candidate, for example, thinking about um, Kamala Harris and how like maybe her presence could result in more people of color in the executive office and how that could like eventually lead to nationwide change or just change in um, the composition of the people who make decisions um, for young people who may not be able to vote yet. Because um, we do have a lot of people who are not 18 yet. Um, so I think that I've seen people motivated also by the positive in the 2016 election um, with like the excitement of wanting to vote to elect a woman. Um, but I think that it really depends on the person. And I've seen that despite people being motivated by the negative, even in 2016, they still try to find the positive um, on the other side. So that's a good thing. Thank you, Lauren. Jessica, what, what's, your, what's your observation having uh, worked with a, a, a ton of Duke students this semester? No, I definitely agree with what Lauren said. I think that it's a, definitely a mix of that positive and negative. Um, and I think it also matters whether it's a national race or the, a local election, because I think it's very easy to get cynical about these things that are constantly in the news. And I think that's, that's a valid cynicism. But I think that a lot of people have been more excited and have been really interested in learning about these local races. Um, and that has been a source of that positive energy towards voting for something instead of against something. Good. Um, let me throw something out um, to, uh, and, and particularly um, starting with uh, Lauren and Jessica on this one. One can imagine a situation November 4th and 7th um, where those of us who believe in the vote could question the legitimacy of our election. Um, and then I want to ask what the role of protests might be then. What might the unification of activism and voting rights be? in a post-election context where the legitimacy of the election might be challenged. Lauren, I know I'm asking you to, you know, um, think about the future and who knows, but I wonder what you're thinking about that. Yeah, so I guess um, it would depend a lot <laughs> on um, what party is challenging the, legit the legitimacy, because I've seen, like, we've gone to, um, we've had protests and we've had people on the other side just, like, at the Trump rally as well, like 500 people not wearing masks. Or we've had um, the reopen NC movement, like literally standing on the other sidewalk. Um, so it, I think it depends a lot on who's challenging that legitimacy. But I think that regardless, um, it would be very interesting to see that fusion because I've seen in this movement a lot that even 
us um, being the movement for Black lives and marching, like we're always having conversations with the Sunrise Movement. And we're always talking about um, like civic engagement and voting. And we're trying to join these things into one. So I feel like that could have the potential to mobilize people even more and understand why it's crucial to make their voices heard, um, which I think would prompt greater engagement in the future, hopefully, how that would resolve um, the current problem at hand. I'm really not sure, but I think it would be a very interesting moment to see for sure. Yeah, Jessica, let me put it to you in a little, uh, maybe a more pointed way. So, you know, as far as I know, you have not been a person right now out in the street with signs. Can you imagine doing that, given your work about voting? I think that it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Um, I think that we are working really hard right now to kind of tell students it's safe to vote using an absentee ballot um, and trying to kind of set the groundwork now to say, you know, your vote will be counted and your vote will be effective. And if that is kind of for whatever reason shown to be untrue, um, I think that will be a difficult situation because I, I know that studies have shown over and over that um, if young people have a negative first experience voting, mm -hmm. it will affect them for the rest of their lives. So mm -hmm. they're gonna be less likely to vote in the future. And I think that creating a generation of people who are disenfranchised or who are frustrated with the process and don't believe in electoral politics will have just you know incredible long-term consequences. Um, so I think it'll be really important to see what happens and to kind of prepare students now to for whatever may happen. Yeah, yeah. John, given what you know about young people, what do you think that might look like? Oh gosh, I worry about this all the time. Uh, I, you know, I, I hate for the sort of like the drawing end of a panel to be so negative, but it, I think it's, I think we should engage with this. I think it's right that, um, you know, uh, Jessica was just spot on in her analysis that um, this, this has real potential to go poorly uh, in terms of um, disenfranchising young people in the future um, if their votes aren't cast. So I, I think the work that, that Lauren, you're, you all are doing is really inspiring to sort of like lay the terrain, like, you know, sort of what we know about engagement in politics is that it, um, it's habitual in a way. Once you've done it before, you're more likely to do it in the future. So the fact that these young people are showing up to protests and, and doing all the inspiring things that you were telling us about at the beginning of this panel is really exciting to me because it speaks to that the, 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 if there is some effort to disenfranchise voters, to not count uh, every vote, to, to sway the election through, through, the, through the courts, uh, uh, independent of the vote itself, that there will be action, that there will be protests in the street, that there will be um, efforts to do uh, affect change not in, in, in voting. So I, I think that's really inspiring. So maybe, that, maybe that's the way that this becomes positive, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm really concerned. I'm, I'm deeply concerned about what the election is gonna look like, especially for young people. Yeah, I was gonna say that it would be interesting also to think about um, if there's a connection between who's protesting the validity and if they've actually even voted and how maybe their protest could result in um, like interpretation of the election when they haven't even potentially voted. I think that's interesting as well. Right, right, yeah, we will see. Um, well, before turning this back uh, to Deandra, who I know uh, we're gonna move, I, I, you know, uh, John, I, I appreciate um, your observation that we don't wanna end this on a bummer. Uh, and, um, but I, I also wanna say that um, all three of you give me great hope. Um, you know, your analysis, John, uh, and um, different take on why young people don't vote resonates so much for me. It's like, ah, this makes sense. Um, sort of executive function and non-cognitive and all the things I observe with our students who care deeply but don't get from point A to point B. Um, I think uh, your book is going to have uh, not only a big impact on the field, but a big impact on, on voting. And uh, Jessica, well, you know what I think about your work, um, it's, uh, and we'll continue to work together uh, as I work to register staff tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. because you convinced me that that's an important thing to do, and I'm grateful for that. And Lauren, um, all, of, all of your work on um, uh, protest and being a, a leading voice for peace and justice at Duke University, uh, honor for me to moderate a panel with you on it. So 
my thanks to all three of you. Um, and uh, I urge folks to, to pick up John and Sunshine's uh, book um, for uh, a really interesting take on this. And now I'll turn this back to Deandra. Thank you so much, Eric. And another huge thanks to John Holbein, Jessica Sullivan, and Lauren Howell for being um, a dream team of panelists uh, to kick off our two-day series. Um, and, and I have to say, I enjoyed every bit of this discussion. I'm fired up about um, what's to come and you know, even more so about the kind of work that you all are doing to promote democracy and citizenship. So thank you so much for all of that and for sharing with us. And to our audience, I hope that you will stay tuned and stay with us for as many panels as you can today. Our next starts at 1130. We're hearing from two longtime campaign and, and politics professionals who are going to share their insights about the role that campaigns play in democracy and the relationship between campaigns and voters. So uh, I don't think you'll want to miss this. So thank you so much for being with us and we hope to see you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you.